In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So I think we've all heard this story and have all wondered what to make of it. This is the only miracle that shows up across all four Gospels. Now, within the Gospels, a lot of lepers get cleansed, a lot of uh, blind people become able to see, a lot of lame get, are able to walk. But when it comes to specific miracles, this is the only one that makes it across all four of them. And it's unique because of, because of that. It's an awkward miracle. You, know, you think that for maximum effect, Jesus would have conjured the bread and the fish out of thin air. But instead, Jesus is taking what is already there and turns it into something more. And that's worth remembering. Now, when I was in school, the, the, the popular way to preach on this was to explain it away. There was a convoluted and very serious sounding story about how the habit in the ancient world was for everybody to have a secret stash of bread kind of tucked away that was just for them. And how Jesus' real miracle was convincing everybody to take what they had already brought and share it with each other. Now, this would have made Jesus the best kindergarten teacher ever. But is that really a miracle? Does it mean anything beyond just sharing? Sharing's nice. I like sharing. You should all share. But it's not a miracle. Now, we're about to get four more weeks of Jesus explaining this story. It's called the Bread of Life Discourse. We wedge it in to this year where we're going through. You've noticed up to now we've been doing a lot of Mark's Gospel. The secret to this is Mark's Gospel isn't really long enough to get us through a whole year. So we have to take the Bread of Life Discourse and we put it in here for five weeks. Jesus is going to explain this miracle over the course of five weeks. And if he's going to do that, it's got to be something more than we've got to learn to share. I don't think that really carries the gravitas that would merit a full chapter in John's gospel. But to start today, I think there's a detail in this story I think it's important and it gets overlooked Whenever we talk about this particular miracle, everybody's reaction to this miracle was to come and take Jesus and make him a king by force. I'll let that sink in. Jesus doesn't want this. At least not in this way. This is when we get to the, the passion narratives, which says... Are you the king of the Jews and Jesus being cagey about this? Because he really does not want to be a king in the way, frankly, that you and I want him to be a king. Certainly he is a king. He's got at least as much authority as a king. But that's not what he's interested in. Not yet anyway. The crowd wants to take him and make him a king by force. It's worth getting a little deeper in the weeds here with this story and the details of it. We're talking about 5,000 men. Now, over the years, translations have played a little fast and loose with this to make it inclusive. And that's a great thing for most stories. Here, it's really important you understand that these are 5,000 men. Because that's a significant number. There are... 100 men in a Roman century. There are 50 centuries in a Roman legion. That's 5,000 men. We're talking about an army here. This detail is not lost on John. It's not just a crowd. And how does somebody become king at this time? Specifically an emperor. 
It was usually a general whose army took them and made them a king. That's how Julius Caesar did it, or more to the point, almost did it. Uh, a host of generals did this. It was Galba and Otho and Vespasian, all in that year, 68, the year of the four emperors. Pertinax and Constantine did the same thing a little while after that. But you get the idea. The army takes their general, makes him their king, and then they go and they take what they want. They take what they want. Have you seen this movie before? The most basic instinct that we have is to see something that we want and to grab at it. And that's what the crowd's about to do. They know they can get what they want, and it is simple. It's enough food to eat. That may be, seem like a small thing, but remember at this time, people worked 15 or 16 hours a day just trying to find enough calories to get through the day. That's a little lost on us. I think whenever, when we want or we need food, we can find it. It may not always be what we want. It may not always be very good. And it may not even be good for us, but it's there. Even for the ones among us who have the least, there is almost always, I don't say always, but almost always a way to get some kind of something to fill your belly up. But calories are cheap. It's nutrition it's harder to find. Now here is more bread than any of these 5,000 men are ever likely to see in their entire lives. And they are going to put Jesus up front and march where they need to go and take it. But this is where the real, real miracle happens. Jesus doesn't talk us all into sharing. And he definitely is not showing us how to organize so we can take what we want. He makes everybody sit down. And what we want, what we most need, Jesus gives it to us. You don't have to reach out and grab for it. Jesus is giving this to you. He is giving it to you because you ought to have it. He's giving it to you because it is good for you. It is bread and it is more. And over the course of the next four weeks, we'll see exactly what he means by this. But today... You have a little bread. We will share a little bread together. You don't have to go and take it. Why? Because Jesus thinks you ought to have it. Glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever. Amen.